Hello, welcome everybody. On behalf of the Museum of Sonoma County, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Collective Arising, a positionality of insistence from Black Bay Area artists. My name is Jeff Nathanson. I'm the executive director of the museum. And before we get started, uh, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which our museum is situated, uh, the traditional land of the Pomo, Huapo, and Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. We honor their history and culture. Um, I also want to introduce uh, Lucia Momo and Ashara Ekundayil, who are our presenters tonight, and they each will acknowledge uh, the uh, land on which they are presenting from, which is actually the East Bay, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And Lucia, I believe, is currently in New Orleans. So, um, Ashara. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much, Jeff, for uh, inviting us to be part of the conversation with the museum tonight and for inviting us to uh, honor the, the land on, on which we're currently located. My name is Asharia Eklundayo. I'm an independent curator. And uh, this evening, I am joining you all from what is called San Francisco, the city of San Francisco. I traditionally live in the city of Oakland, California, which is just across the bay. And this is the unceded land of the Ramata Shaloni and Ramsa Maloney people. It is unceded because it has never been uh, passed over, sold, or offered uh, to any government or any other entity. And that we walk upon this land with humility, with a light stick, and we want to thank the Ohlone people for stewarding the land and for continuing to uh, hold it with much love and allowing us to be here uh, to use its energy and the ancestral understanding for our creative practice. Thank you. Thank you, Ashara. Thank you, Ashara and Lucia. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lucia, and I'm currently in New Orleans, which uh, is also known as Bobanka, um, the originally uh, Choctaw territory here in New Orleans. Um, Bobanka was the land of a thousand tongues, a thousand languages, uh, before it was uh, what we now call New Orleans. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to be in such a beautiful and vibrant, uh, culturally rich city um, and thank the ancestors of this land. Very good. Thank you. And now um, we're going to get started on our program. I'm actually really thrilled that we're doing this tonight. Um, we offer this program uh, in honor of Black History Month but by no means is um, a history that we only want to honor during February. Uh, the contributions of Black Americans, artists, people of all different backgrounds and uh, just addressing a whole range of every human endeavor on this continent um, has to be honored and we have to really bring the history and the culture and the vibrancy of what Black Americans have um, achieved and what they contribute to our society. And so um, with that in mind, actually, as the director of the museum, I was really looking a few years ago to diversify our art exhibition committee and to do more diverse programming uh, through our exhibitions and uh, our, the educational and public programs that we offer. Uh, and, and I was really pleased to meet uh, Lucia Momo, who uh, at the time and until recently was with the Berkeley Art Museum. And she joined our uh, exhibition committee, um, has just been an incredible contributor to uh, our progress and to the kinds of exhibitions we've been able to present to, uh, to the uh, public. And I thought it would be really wonderful uh, for Lucia to curate an exhibition that looked at Black artists and the contributions uh, to contemporary art that uh, we had not really, I, I don't think we'd really spent enough uh, of our uh, time and, our, uh, and devoted enough of our gallery space to. 
And so um, Lucia came back with the idea that she co-curate this show with uh, Ashara. And uh, we're excited because we have an exhibition on the calendar for next year. And it was supposed to happen this, this, this last year. Uh, it was supposed to happen in 2020. And uh, because of the pandemic, everything is crazy. It's, it's all been changed. But we wanted to offer at least something right now to uh, to share with the public the background of why we think this exhibition is important and what we can look forward to next year during our exhibition schedule. Um, so just a few words of introduction and, th and then I'll turn this over to our presenters. Uh, Ashara Ekundayo is an independent curator, uh, a cultural strategist and arts organizer organizer. Um, she is, as she said, based in uh, the East Bay. Um, her intersectional creative worldview offers both a uh, an Afrofuturist and radical Black feminist fr framework centering the lives, traditions, and expertise of Black women of the African diaspora. Her philanthropic platform, Artist as First Responder, serves as a portal for her recent initiatives, the Reflection Fund for Artists and Black Space Residency, both of which provide a container for imagination, inquiry, activity, and rest. Oshara is also a forum curator at the Museum of the African Diaspora and hosts a monthly online live zine called Blatant, where she moderates discussions on art, joy, and rage. Lucia, I, I've never said your, 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 your name out loud, and I'm going to apologize in advance, Lucia. Alabundmi Momo, did I say that right? <laughs> uh, is a curator, writer, and scholar who works as a curatorial, or worked until recently as a curatorial assistant at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives. Her research there examined issues of anti Black racism, the production of history and the role museums play in the formation of national and regional identities. Momo views her curatorial practice as an extension of her social and environmental activism and works to make museums and art more accessible to marginalized communities. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Lucia and Ashara. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for that, Jeff. It's a, a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. So, uh, Lucia, I know we haven't really talked about how we might start into this conversation, but I think it might be interesting for us to talk about how we came to be co-curating uh, in this particular container at this particular time and uh, what intentionality looks like as we're speaking about a collective uprising and an insistence of black space and the, the creation and maintaining of a black space. What, what's your memory of, of how we met? Because it might be a little different than mine. That's true. Um, so I, I remember meeting you when on campus at UC Berkeley, Lee Rayford was giving, um, well, she was in discussion with a uh, Toyin, Toyin Oji Odutola and Andrew Bell, um, two wonderful artists uh, at, on campus in a very intimate setting. And there were maybe 15 other people present in a small room. Um, and afterward, uh, I, we spoke briefly and I mentioned that I was working at Bamfa and that I was a curatorial assistant, was mm -hmm. my curator. Um, and we were so excited uh, to meet another curator, another black woman curator in the Bay Area as well. You gave me your, your card. And um, I, um, I, I followed up because I was, I, was, I was new, not necessarily to the Bay Area because I grew up here, um, but new to the professional realm. I don't see, I can, I'll stop my screen share real quick um, so we can see each other. Let's see, we'll come back. I know because I'm looking at this little tiny picture. Now I can see you more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think I followed up and you graciously invited me to your, your gallery, the Shara Aikman Gallery in Oakland, and 
we had, I think we were, I was there for maybe two, three hours. Yeah, um, yeah. And we spoke about art, the art world, um, and, and what it means to be, to be a black woman in this space today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have the same origin story of how we met. Um, I want to, I guess I'll, I'll add that I was surprised actually that there were any Black women curatorial partners at Bamfa at the time. And I was also intrigued by the idea that um, the way in which your, your work as a curatorial assistant at that point um, was leading you into all of these other kinds of questions around insistence and what it looks like, I think, on a national scale in terms of access to um, access for Black people and Black women in particular who don't have PhDs to enter into, you know, those spaces of the title curator, who gets to be a curator and what it means to be a curator inside of a museum as well. Uh, and then I was also just excited because we uh, we have a, an age gap and so I'm always happy to like talk with uh, black women younger than I am who have a similar kind of interest but you know a different kind of path so yeah yeah, yeah. and so you know when it was really wonderful for you to invite me to, to be in conversation with you and uh, to be you know, possibly working on an exhibition together. And how over the months now, I mean, uh, several months at this point, that that conversation has seen you move across the country, you know, and become part of the curatorial team for the Prospect New Orleans uh, exhibition, which is brilliant. And I'm really excited about that. And and we just have all of these stories to tell because it's it's been quite, uh, a robust conversation around the reckoning of um, anti-Blackness, white supremacy, and patriarchy inside of cultural institutions and museums and galleries across the United States and across, across the world, honestly. So I just want to celebrate you for making a leap, you know, and, and us still being able to hold this conversation that I think is, is really special to both of us uh, in the Bay Area, um, an insistence of taking up space for Black artists and uh, a position of, mm, a, as we say, a positionality, you know, of collective rising for what is called Black art or contemporary Black art in the movement right now that we're inside of. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. And I, can, I just want to second that um, it is, it's hard. It's coming easier, but it, it's hard being a, a Black woman in the curatorial world. And one thing I very much appreciate about our um, our friendship is how warm and welcoming and um, gracious you have been in, in sharing your knowledge um, and in having these conversations with me. Um, as you know, anyone here tonight, tonight probably knows it's been a, a rough year for Black women in the arts, um, and we've had to remain uh, insistent on being heard um, and on on some kind of accountability uh, for institutions that have really shut us out. Um, so I, I appreciate your your support and um, I'm sorry, it looks like my internet's a little bit unstable. Um, but I appreciate your, this sisterhood. Um, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know what I would do without it. Um, yeah. when, when Jeff offered to have me curate a show here, they were, they were the first person I thought of. Um, I didn't think I could do it on my own um, at all because we wanted to do it like in December. Um, <laughs> right. And, <laughs> <laughs> knowledge Ashara mm -hmm. so I was uh, I wanted to work with you and really see this as a um, an opportunity for mentorship as well for me so um, I guess with that I can I can start our uh, the presentation mm -hmm. our inspiration mm -hmm. um, so I think we have probably about like 40 more minutes so okay okay um 
I think it's a good time to, to talk about the different, oh, it just goes right into this, um, into the, the different collectives uh, that inspire our, our work. Mm -hmm. um, the first one being Spiral. Spiral was a New York based collective that kind of formed out of the March on Washington. Um, it was very male dominant. Uh, so I highlighted Emma Amos in, in this. Mm -hmm. um, she was the only woman in Spiral. Um, and, and I hope it's okay. I, I'll just dive into this and you can illuminate, you know, add anything, uh, Ashara. Um, but the conversations that happened around Spiral were not just about, uh, or were how to create some kind of a, a, a Black aesthetic or a Black voice, but then also how to meaningfully okay, with, um, with politics to meaningfully engage with social issues that were affecting um, Black people in the United States um, and what was the responsibility of the artist. Um, and so I believe it was, I think Bermari Bearden came up with the, the name Spiral. And there's a little quote here that the, the spiral moves outward embracing all directions and yet continually upward. Um, and that's a, that's just a really beautiful, uh, visual, um, but then also wonderful in thinking of the, the power of a collective to embrace all directions, to embrace the multiplicity of, of Black identities in particular, but then to also keep the collective arising, you know, to keep the momentum moving upward. Um, and then to uh, redefine the image of I added woman um, in terms of the, the Negro experience, this was written in the 60s, um, in terms of the Black experience. Um, so really centralizing uh, the Black perspective. You know, I want to I want to intersect here. Like, you know, we're going to go through just a few of the the collectives. You know, that are part of our inquiry and part of our conversation we've been having over these months in designing um, in designing the exhibition. You know, but there's a roll call, and you know, in the same way in which we you know, have acknowledged the land that we're, that we're framing the conversation on, the land that we're actually creating upon, you know, these, these, uh, these collectives come from a, a Black radical tradition, you know, and for me, and for you as well, you know, those, that tradition is intersectional, it is womanist, it's Afrofuturist as well, and so Spiral is, is one of the collectives, and I know we're going to talk about a, a few other ones, but I just, I just want to list the Kumbahi River Collective, Afro Cobra Arts Collective that we're going to speak about both of those, but there's also uh, emergent strategy, you know, and that idea of a collective, the movement for Black Lives as a collective, the Church of Black Feminist Thought as a collective, um, Black Women's Breathing Course, you know, as also a theoretical framework and a collective uh, authored by Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums. And so I just I want to just kind of give us some context for um, why we picked you know, or selected just at least for this evening's conversation from this particular group of Black collectives. And that not all of them are seen as artist collectives or visual artist collectives, but are very much centered in the, um, uh, the history and the impact of Blackness, you know, and of uh, Black life and of uh, Black futurism, Black futurist ideology. So. Um, as you move forward into into the presentation, I just wanted to give us a a framework, you know, kind of the the underpinnings of why the Black Collective and how how we show up. I think in a particular vibe in the Bay Area as we get to that at the end of the the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Shar. And with that, we can uh, move on a bit to Afro Cobra. Um, and this. Afrocobra was one of the first collectives I was introduced to in grad school. Um, I probably I was introduced to Afrocobra at the same time as Spiral, but Jay Jarrell is just one of my favorite artists and her revolutionary suit that she's wearing in this uh, is just, I think maybe one of my favorite art pieces of all time. Um, and what Afrocobra did that's a little different was really focusing also on the aesthetics of what black art could look like and they made me think the, the Kool-Aid color frontal images, um, open color positive images really made me evaluate um, gallery space and evaluate um, 
modernist art by white artists in particular as um, ex maybe not exclusionary, but as uh, it, it ex Avro Cobra helped me understand where my, uh, um, I wanna say tastes, cause that's such a loaded term, but where my preferences kind of lie in the bright and the loud and in the, the aliveness that Afro Cobra kind of represented, even in this gray tweed suit, Jay Jarrell's uh, magazine clip, each little you know, bullet has a, a painted tip. You know, there's like a, a pop of something beautiful and alive and coming from a Nigerian family, color was just everywhere. Um, and so I fell in love with Afro Cobra when I was in grad school. Um, and that's why I wanted to include them on this. Yeah, I fell in love with them as well. Um, I remember, and and you know, I remember meeting Jay Jarrell a couple of years ago at uh, the California African American Museum, at the kind of closing gathering for We Wanted a Revolution, and uh, she had on one of her jackets, and I was just kind of like in awe. We were all in awe, <laughs> you know, that we still had the opportunity to to meet and talk with her and listen to some stories about Afrocobra and, and the impact even of the location of Chicago. Uh, and for me, because it's a, a collective that was born the year that was born the year that I was born, uh, 1968 is a particularly poignant part of American history and the culture in terms of the civil rights movement um, and, and the ideas and the speaking of Black is beautiful, you know, and that, that that is a statement that I grew up hearing and that it felt effortlessly, you know, from the tongues of my mother and my father, their friends, the people around me uh, in Detroit, Michigan. So like a little trek to Chicago was a really normal kind of thing. So I'm so, ha I'm so happy Upper Cobra is, in, is inside of this conversation with us. I will say just because I because you said you got to meet uh, Jay Jarrell at We Want a Revolution. Yeah meet her but I did get to see her when she, the um Hold the Nation opened at SF MoMA this past year yeah um, and I got to ask her a question about is, like did the revolutionary suit did that mean did, was that like a symbol of you know maybe women didn't bear arms but you know she was you know strong in her you know in her own way and she's like I never said I didn't bear arms we were in some really you know okay <laughs> <laughs> said, oh no I didn't say that <laughs> Like they were the they had what was it's also really beautiful about this collective in particular is what they offer to the community in the teaching art to, to people and to children in particular in the community and in being in neighborhoods that were you know more dangerous and they were I guess like shaking down within like a couple of weeks of opening their studios for children and so they didn't have to protect themselves so thinking also of like how black women have to protect how we have to protect ourselves and thinking of myself as an individual as someone who's strong and can protect myself mm -hmm. um uh personally I was uh wonderfully delighted to hear her response that uh, she's like, no, we didn't need someone to take, you know, I didn't expect anyone to take care of me, but I knew I needed to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but the, but the idea of, you know, the wearable art, the fashion as armor, you know what I mean? That that was also part of the expression and the invitation for, you know, for black folks to just like show up and show out and, you know, and be unique, you know, what you were doing and, and all of the other kind of, I think, political underpinnings of like uh, labor around fiber work, around cloth work, around what might be seen as a craft or even the removal of fashion as a conversation inside of so-called high art. And she just, you know, brought it right to us because it's one of the many ways in which uh, women showed up, you know, in the movement in creating armor for us. Yeah, who's next? Oh, wow. Well, favorite. Hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you open up this one. <laughs> I'll open up this one. Okay. Kumbahi River Collective, founded in 1974, operated you know, fully until 1980. This quote that um, we have here at the top Black women are inherently valuable is the absolute uh, crux of my curatorial practice. 
And uh, as someone who was not an art, I didn't go to art school, but I did take art class. You know, I was a women's studies major and a communications major and was working inside of like African-American history and culture. Uh, this idea that black women were not meant to be prone inside of a movement um, really spoke to me then, you know, as a young person, as a young woman, um, and still does. So, I mean, as a predecessor to all the work that we're doing now, Black women are inherently valuable. And again, I'm going to, you know, pull from uh, Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, who says, you know, not adjacent to other liberation struggles, as in white women's rights struggles or a patriarchal Black movement struggle, but valued because we exist. You know, that that's what um, Kambahi River Collective was was really about and you know and we and they speak about and we speak about their work you know coming from a black lesbian socialist feminist collective and believe that if black women were free everyone else would have to be free because our freedom necessitates the destruction of all systems of oppression so our value is not contingent upon what we produce um, it's how we show up it's what we do and it's and before that and without question we are valuable so you know Pulling from that knowing inside of, you know, how we frame this whole conversation around the collective, um, the commitment, you know, to struggle, the commitment to struggle against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression uh, is very much, as we say, the synthesis of oppressions creates the conditions of our lives, and therefore we resist and we insist. Um, I don't have too much to add. I I just want to echo everything that you said. And um, actually, you were, you were the person who introduced me to this collective. Uh, when we first started talking about this exhibition, you said, well, of course, we have to talk mm -hmm. about the, the Kumbahi, I hope I said that right, River mm -hmm. Club. And uh, in reading their statement, I was just floored. Um, I was like, holy crap, like they were ahead of everyone in so many ways mm -hmm. because they were black women who were also lesbians because they could see all the different ways that oppressions were, were that they were oppressed but that other people were oppressed and how they needed to, how we need to bring everyone mm -hmm. in. We, mm -hmm. we don't rise up if we don't all rise up together. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and, and understanding that if black women are free, if black people are free, then that facilitates, it necessitates and it facilitates the work and the freedom of all other oppressed people. And so to stand in solidarity on that and to have that energy and that understanding um, also frame your creative practice, whether that practice is writing or movement or film, you know, or the curator, you know, in, in our case, uh, is, a, is a particular kind of a story, a particular kind of uh, narrative to have. And it is the framing of the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter also being a collective framed and created by three Black queer women. Uh, and being, and that being, you know, unequivocal, period. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I guess one thing to note for the audience, if you, if you didn't catch this, um, the Kumbahi River Collective was intersectional before intersectionality was a thing. Um, that's right. the, well, the reason I added the second, because I almost just left this slide as Black women are inherently valuable. Um, that kind of reading that for the first time, I didn't know how much I needed to hear it. Um, you know, it, it's a, that was the, what, probably one of the more powerful statements, but then to continue to read um, the statement and to be like, oh my God, they were ahead, uh, they, you know, and people still don't quite understand intersectionality and the, uh, the synthesis of oppressions is mm -hmm. actually a really beautiful way to put um, what people are trying to grasp today um, and some people are failing to grasp. Um, let's see, do you have anything else you wanna add? Mm -mm. No, we could do a whole, several lectures just on this okay. so let's move on <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> i think we move on to the bay area which introduces of course the black panthers um and we have two slides for this i'll give everyone a peek because we have contemporary um and the black panthers of the six uh well 
70s and 80s, I guess. Um, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and the so much of our work is is centering women. Um, so I wanted to make sure that when we're talking about the Black Panthers then and now that we're talking about the women as well. Um, and while the Black Panthers are not necessarily seen as an artistic collective, and, and you could say the same thing with the Kumbaya River Collective, um, there are artists within the movement. And I, for me, uh, as, as Jeff said in the, my introduction, I, I see my curatorial practice as an extension of my activism. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel the same with some of the artists that I love are pushing conversations forward. They're artists in the sense that um, you're, uh, we're catalysts for progress within society. I think the artist has a special vision um, and an art work that can kind of speak to the issues that the Black Panthers were pushing, um, that the, the, um, the, the political collectives were also discussing. The, there's a natural place for art within each of these movements. I mean, in kind of going back to Jay Jarrell, the fashion in the Black Panther movement, like the picture we have on the far. So slick, so slick. Come <laughs> on, come on. How can you not love the black leather jacket, the black tam, black pants, black boots, black glasses? How, I, come on. <laughs> like, it's all the things. You know, what I'll add about in, oh my God, the Black Panther Party. Um, so much of why I chose to move to Oakland, California is because of the, the legacy of the Black Panther Party mm -hmm. and what it means to model true revolutionary love for people, what it means to model um, care and belonging for a people, that th these are our teachers, they continue to be our teachers. And, you know, not just, you know, the folks who were there at the beginning and the founding, you know, um, with Dr. Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seal, but all of the other uh, beautiful souls that came together, you know, to, to figure this out, you know, how are we gonna take care of our people? It's the Black Panther Party, you know, for, for defense, for love, for health, for care. It's, it's all of those things. And that at Oakland, California is the birthplace of that movement. And even the breakfast program, you know, for the children before they went to school. And that it was the men who, you know, spent their time like making the food and making sure that the babies ate. Um, but that there isn't any movement on this planet that is not fueled by the work of the artist. It's your creative self that is coming forward to even bring this solution into community. And it wasn't until I had moved to Oakland that I ever heard about Joan Tarika Lewis, who I hope will join us um, at one of our subsequent conversations. And she was the first woman to join the Black Panther Party here in Oakland, California. She was also the first artist. And we know that uh, we uh, celebrate the work often of uh, Baba Emery Douglas, who is still alive and well, living in San Francisco, and is dear to me. Like I've, I've become um, a student of his and, and willing to sit at his feet anytime he's willing to, to give a lesson or just to hang out. But I got, I got to know, uh, as we call her, you know, Sister you know, Tarika, Joan Tarika Lewis, through the African American Art and Cultural Complex in San Francisco, and uh, their co-directors, Melora and Melanie Green, who are very close to uh, Sister, Sister Tarika. And so to be able to look through her portfolio, like all of these hand sketches, like a big black book that's like, you know, loose papers and tattered and torn um, work from, you know, the Black Panther Party newspaper, newspapers, things that were put in, things that never got put in, but that they're still there and the appreciation for, um, her eye and setting the tone. Uh, before there was Emory, there was Tarika. And that I just, I wanna always honor and shout her out and invite you all to, to look up Joan Tarika Lewis, who is still teaching music, still like painting murals in deep East Oakland, still teaching, still loving up on us. And, um, you know, the work of the Black Panther Party is, is 
huge. There's no way that we're going to not um, honor and call them out. And then the last thing I'll say about it, and I'll be quiet, uh, just also shouting out the, the work of archivist Elizabeth Tellison, who uh, lives in, in East Oakland, uh, not too far from me actually, and over the years has befriended me, allowed me access to her archive, um, you know, given me things out of her archive, like when I see something that she might want, you know, we send each other notes and she's just been an amazing mentor, I hope that she will also join us for a conversation around collectives because she has a massive archive and probably the largest or the second largest archive of uh, works um, from the Black Panther Party and specifically around uh, Angela Davis, who was not a Black Panther, but who was associated with the Black Panther Party and you know whose image has been captured and repurposed for many, many things, much like Che Guevara. So. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful. I, the only thing I'll say is because you brought up Che Guevara, is um, you'd also brought up the love of the Black Panther Party, and he has the quote: "Every revolutionary is motivated by a great feeling of love," um, and that's something that uh, that resonates so well within the Black Panther Party, but also within the power of a collective is the mm -hmm. the love for for. for the collective love, yeah. mm -hmm. that's a mm -hmm. right way to put it. Um, and I'll I'll move us along as well because we're already at nine or sorry nine forty my time. Um, it's seven forty uh, y'all's time. Um, and just really quickly, whoop, too far ahead. Um, we talk about the the mural that is is in the process of going up. I don't know if it's done yet. I know there was an. I think it's almost done. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think they're. It was supposed to be just this part of the home um, that was also bought by a woman who moved to the Bay Area because of the Black Panther Party. Um, her name is her name is Jill Christina Vest. It's her home. It's her home. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, it, in, it works really well. The theme of our our exhibition because it's women of the Black Panther Party and. Uh, part of the mural will have the names of I believe 300 women um, mm -hmm. members of the Black Panther Party. Um, you can, there, I, you know, they have started uh, inscribing the names on the side of the house. Uh, it's actually the whole side of the house. I know this this photo is like we're just giving you a peek of it, but you can follow the progress of the mural on Instagram um, at you know Oakland West Oakland Mural Project, mm -hmm. and or you can even like Google mural Black Panther Party mural or women of the Black Panther Party uh, and you'll see news stories and everything because they did do an unveiling of it on the 14th of February. Uh, I, the, the lead curator, not the lead curator, the lead muralist is Rachel Wolf. Uh, she's, she's, she's a, her level of like quickness and badassery is, you know, kind of <laughs> not to be, you know, not to be ignored. And um, shout out to the Bay uh, Bay Area Mural Project that she is also part of. But this is a really striking um, mural on the whole side of the house, and it does have the names, and it does um, invite people to like come in and consider like who are the rank and file people. There wouldn't have been a Black Panther Party without the women of the Black Panther Party. There just wouldn't have been. And um, the tr the additional story is that it sits at the corner of 9th and Center Street, which is actually the location um, that Dr. Huey P. Newton took his last breath. And that there is actually a mural, uh, not only a mural, but they renamed a portion of 9th Street uh, after Dr. Huey P. Newton a couple of days ago. And uh, local sculptor, Black woman Dana King is uh, in the process of sculpting a bronze bust of, of Dr. Newton that will be installed this October coming up uh, on the anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party in West Oakland. So again, we're just we're pulling the thread, the history uh, of revolutionary love is still alive and that Black people are still making art and that Black women are still making art. So uh, I don't want us to like miss the opportunities to continue to, to talk about that. And the next time that you and I have a conversation, there'll be more to show. Okay. And then we'll, 
We'll kind of move on to specifically art collectives in the Bay Area that are also, well, I mean, this is an art collective, um, but we'll, I think, I believe the next, this, this art collective, the next two art collectives, I'm gonna give to you, Ashara, and hmm. I'll do the last three. Okay. Three point nine Art Collective. Okay, um, an association of African American artists and curators uh, and art writers who live in San Francisco to draw attention to the city's dwindling Black population. Um, many people know, and many maybe don't know, that San Francisco had a very vibrant and you know significant population of Black folks here. You know, throughout different parts of the city. Since I'm speaking from San Francisco today, I'm actually um, inside of my own artist residency as part of a, a collective conversation with Villa SF and the French consulate and a new collective called Black Space Residency, which we can talk about on another visit. But I'm in San Francisco um, in a place where the population has dwindled down to less than 4% and maybe at this point, even less than 3% uh, African-American folks, but there's still black people here. But the 3.9 Art Collective is probably the first collective that I learned about when I moved here to the Bay uh, a decade ago. Um, and Ramakan or Weistis is like one of the artists who uh, participates, or at least in the past was participating as part of that collective, Rodney Ewing, um, William Rhodes, uh, Melanie and Melora Green. Um, so several artists, you know, that we know from San Francisco who continue to, to produce work at a, at a high level and at, a, at a, a fairly high rate as well. And so, um, yeah, we would be remiss to like not, not invite uh, some of the artists and the artwork from that collective. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm aware of the time too. Okay. The Black Woman is God uh, is an annual exhibition series that features Black women and film identified artists that celebrates Black female presence as the highest spiritual form, God or goddess, and challenges viewers to do the same. This is one of the most revolutionary uh, art collectives that I have come up against as an adult independent curator and uh, brain child and gift of uh, visual artist and educator Karen Siniferu and uh, curator and educator Melora Green. As I mentioned, Melora Green is a uh, co-director at the African American Art and Culture Complex. This uh, exhibition began at the African American Art and Culture Complex before they were the co-directors. In fact, the person who was the co-director at the time, name is London Breed. London Breed is now the mayor of San Francisco, Black woman mayor, and Melanie and Melora are the co-directors. So this, um, this conversation that Karen has blown folks' mind, I mean, you know, there are people who push back up against it, but I embrace it. And uh, some of the artists who have, I've come to know and love because of this conversation, this insistence that we honor the divinity of the, of the Black woman um, are Sydney Kane, also known as Sage Stargate, uh, Idris Hassan. Um, you know, I, I really could go on and on, but it, every year or every other year, maybe at this point, 60 plus Black women artists are on display between the African American Art and Culture Complex and Soul Marts. Who's next? Yes. Oh. You want to take this? You can try it because <laughs> I, I know a lot about this one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know we have a video with this one. And if oh, let's, you, let's watch it. Isn't that, yeah, this is fantastic. It's a short one. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. House Full of Black Women, site-specific ritual performance project that addresses issues of displacement, well-being, and sex trafficking of Black women and girls in Oakland. It is the gift and offering of my beloveds Amara Tabor Smith and Ellen Sebastian Chang. It's set over a five-year period, and it asks the question, how can we as Black women and girls find space to breathe and be well within a stable home? And uh, I hope that it will continue. It has been extremely impactful 
beautiful offering uh, here in Oakland and House Full of Black Women uh, is, you know, fueled from the work, the choreographic work and educational work of Deepwater Stance Theater. Um, and I, technically I should stop, I'll go really, really quickly. Um, I'm, the Five Fists Collective was started by um, Choi Chu and, oh goodness, um, sorry, I'm just gonna do this real quickly. Uh, oh, no, I think it's, is it Leela Weaver? Did Leela help no, start Five Fists? No? Tiana, uh, they're like, uh, crap. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, three artists who were at, I believe, CAA or C, yeah, C, CAC, College Arts. What is it in California? I'm, there are so many different CACs. Oh, um, California I, is, College of the Arts or California College of the Arts. CCA. 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 There you yeah. go. <laughs> um, but, uh, Multimedia Collective is dedicated to exploring Blackness as an idea of consciousness, reference, and embodying experience through space, language, and visual culture. Five Fifths aims to disrupt the idea of a formal gallery space by curating exhibits uh, according to five pillars uh, known only to its founding members. Each project is curated, oh, we're no longer in presenter mode, um, is curated based on space, ritual, intuition, um, ooh, and and I can't see the last line, um, and current research. Um, and then we have the NER Collective, which I personally was introduced to through um, the No Neutral Alliance, which is uh, part of the NER Collective, I believe is an umbrella um, under which the No Neutral Alliance uh, is uh, held under. And they were instrumental in um, most recently supporting uh, Taylor Brandon, who had worked at SF MoMA, um, and I really got to see the power of a collective standing behind a Black woman who had been silenced by um, the PR department at SF MoMA, who deleted uh, Taylor's comments on uh, on their um, their Instagram page. Um, we have also a video on here with Yutunde Olegabaju, which we don't have time for. Um, but if you guys have a chance, it's the video she did with SF MoMA, ironically, um, and it's absolutely stunning um her uh, i'll find it i'll find it and put it in the in the draft in the in the chat yeah. awesome thank you ashara um we also have Mise sese um sese i believe is how i'm saying adrian walker um and oh dear i'm terrible with names y'all i'm sorry it's a, a actually a terrible part about my curatorial practice um they're a beautiful wonderful collective um, and a, a few of them, I think, are also represented by the Point Two Gallery. Um, and then House of Malico, um, we have Sasha Kelly and uh, Shah Noir Hussein, um, two, two artists who are featured here. Sasha Kelly, I was introduced to her work while working at Berkeley. Uh, one of the works in our collection, or in now their collection, I guess, since I'm no longer there, um, was Transit Eyes. And I was transfixed by that the um, photograph that she took of a woman in transit, just dazed. Um, and Sasha Kelly's work is this beautiful exploration of what it means to be a, a queer Black mother as well. She's a, a mother, lived in Oakland, and because of gentrification and the rising cost of rent had been pushed out um, into uh, where I grew up, um, Antioch. And uh, uh, her, her work is just really beautiful uh, exploration of the complex contradictions of, of celebrating femininity and all the different forms of femininity. And then Shah Noir, who I actually uh, know through the East Bay Meditation Center is a, a wonderful human being and uh, a, a brilliant photographer as well and really explores um, as well a collective gatherings, um, spiritual collective gatherings in her, in her work. And I will, I'll stop there um, because we're like five minutes over, I think, um, and open this up for questions. Thank you guys all for bearing with uh, that last minute, but I think that video was worth it. So I'll stop share. Thank you so much. And um, wow, that video is really powerful and uh, definitely worth it. So thank you for sharing that with us. 
Um, so um, a, a few questions uh, come up to, in, in my mind uh, that I'll um, start with here. And then uh, I do encourage um, our audience members, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A portion of, um, you just uh, click in the lower right. Uh, don't go too far right, then you'll leave the meeting, but <laughs> or the the uh, presentation. But uh, just click on Q and A, and you can type your question, and um, um, I can read it right here, and then uh, present that to um, uh, both Lucia and Ashara. Uh, but a couple of things came to mind um, during this uh, incredible presentation, and there's so much information, uh, so much. Uh, rich artwork that and activism that a lot of the American public and, and even people who are really uh, very knowledgeable about or think seemingly, you know, they think they're knowledgeable about contemporary and modern art. Um, and yet there's this whole world of activism and art making, which is uh, so important. But I, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts about when um, let's say uh, a, a mem uh, uh, an artist who's a member of um, an artist collective, a black artist collective. And I'm thinking in particular of somebody like Richard Mayhew, who was a member of Spiral. And um, uh, I actually curated him into an exhibition last year. Um, our museum presented Landscape Awe to Activism. And I saw the work that he did as relevant to uh, themes of landscape interpretation um, uh, interpretation, interpretation of color, and mo most importantly, our relationship to the environment. And um, in terms of the, let's say, the intent of uh, artists and their activism and within a collective and their intersection with, let's say, the more mainstream art world, um, how do you see that relationship? Mm. If, if at all. <laughs> well, it's definitely connected. Um, and Richard Mayhew's a, a very famous artist now, um, who that I don't know if anyone's seen, there's a new documentary on HBO on black art and he's you know, still kicking. Um, and they, they show him in his studio painting uh, fresh onto the canvas. Uh, I think the, there's this misconception that black artists haven't always been engaging with the overall, uh, you know, the, the more mainstream, I guess, so maybe just white art. Um, and, uh, you know, from my, my background is in 19th century art. Um, and so I know that from like the very beginning, Black artists and Black people, um, as sitters and portraits in particular, were engaging with what was considered to be American, you know, uh, American art. Um, and, you know, Frederick Douglass commissioning dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of portraits of himself. Sir Jordan Truth also commissioning portraits of herself. Um, you have uh, Henry Oswald Tanner um, engaging initially with, with racial issues and then eventually moving towards spirituality um, in part because people were, had backlash against black artists engaging in, uh, in racial issues in the 19th century. Um, and at a lot of, uh, of our production was controlled by uh, the violence that uh, surrounded us in the 19th century. Um, and of course, um, uh, Robert, Duncans, Robert Duncanson, Duncanson uh, who is in the White House now um, and was part of the inauguration, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Biden's inauguration. Um, I mean, Black artists uh, in the 20th century are stand out from some, in some ways from Black artists in the 19th century that they were not alone. Um, they, the, the power of collective, uh, the power of the collective really pushed Black artists into the mainstream. Um, that's how you end up with Norman Lewis and, uh, and Richard Mayhew and um, Mikhail Woodruff. You have all these different artists who, because of their connections with other Black artists, whereas, you know, Frederick Douglass, I don't, for me personally, I think he didn't have his super his power until he went to Haiti and had, was surrounded by Black love and by a, a successful story of, uh, of insurrection. Um, exactly. That's what I'm saying, that the power of, of revolutionary insurrection resistance activated him in a totally different way. You know, there's a, there's a saying 
in an old Arrested Development song, not the TV show Arrested Development, but the, the revolutionary black hip hop group out of New Orleans, Arrested Development that says, just a shell until you decide to rebel. You see what I'm saying? And that's, I so am agreeing with you around this piece around Frederick Douglass, you know? It's like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta come with something. You gotta come with something else to like shake this cage. You know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm thinking also about the, the black artists in the 19th and the 20th century that escaped and took refuge outside of the United States as well. Um, some of, of, you know, some folks who we know of this generation, like writers like Saul Williams, you know what I mean, who lived in Paris for a long time, but also um, obviously Josephine Baker and Barbara Chase Rabot and, um, you know, many other visual artists as well as, as writers like James Baldwin, you know, who took refuge outside of, of this conversation to take a, a breath, honestly, you know, kind of like from the, the rigidness of, of how, hard the places are inside of like cultural institutions, I think in the United States as well, Jeff. Yeah, really fascinating. Um, well, it, staying with the um, somewhat historical track uh, for another moment. Uh, so the, the, the history of the Black Panthers and the impact nationally, but you know, really thinking about their origins in the East Bay and uh, I can't help but think of some of my own um, uh, interactions with members of, of the Panthers in years past. Uh, in the 1990s, I was director of the Richmond Art Center, and uh, we we had a developing community of, of Black artists in the East Bay who really more and more were um, becoming involved with the Richmond Art Center and teaching and, and exhibiting. And uh, it, it led to, at a certain point, uh, Fed, uh, Federica Newton uh, had a book um, she was uh, publishing and so the uh, book signing and, and the uh, reception for that book publication was uh, at the Richmond Arts Center and um, the members of the, uh, of the Panthers, uh, uh, Eldridge Cleaver, I met him that night. Uh, it was just uh, amazing to be in the presence of, of all of this, this power. And so fast forward to just recent years um, here in our own museum, uh, Museum of Sonoma County, uh, David Huffman was an exhibiting artist with us in um, uh, two years ago in the ex ex exhibition, See Something, Say Something, which was about issues that are um, really threats to society besides what Homeland Security tells us, uh, the threats such as sexism, racism, gun violence, um, and, and on and on. And uh, so I just recently recorded an interview with um, David Huffman, who uh, it, it'll be posted on our website uh, soon. Uh, and he, cut, he grew up in the East Bay with, um, you know, in, in a household that was frequented by uh, Black Panthers. His mother did graphics um, for the family. But now he and his own artwork is drawing from abstraction, uh, let's say black culture and, and patterning and symbolism, and also is really looking um, him, uh, himself as being an Afrofuturist. And I'm really interested in what your thoughts are about the artists in these especially contemporary artists in the Black collectives um, that you, you featured, um, especially the visual artists. Uh, we, we can maybe uh, talk about the per performance aspect um, in a moment. But looking at, uh, well, I, I think we had a question specifically about the mean, what, what is Afrofuturist? Uh, it might be good to talk about that. But also I'm really interested coming from a background in abstract painting about the intersection of abstraction, uh, let's say African inspired patterning and Afrofuturism and, and how that all, it, I don't know. It, I, don't, I don't totally understand where that, those intersections are, but maybe you can help enlighten me. Oh, Ashara, you were, oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I was laughing. <laughs> um, okay, 
you know, for folks who are like not hearing or not knowing that this is that this term Afrofuturism is, you know, a coined term um, by a cat named Mark uh, Derry, I believe, in like '93. Um, who is he? Is not black, by the way. And this idea that um, there is this belief and understanding, as I mentioned, that there are black people in the future. And uh, that's a, a, another term coined by Pittsburgh based uh, artist, mother, warrior educator, Alicia Wormsley. But these, these ideas that are like pulled from the past, you know, this idea of blackness in the culture, you know, from works from folks like Octavia Butler, Sojourner Truth, Sun Ra, uh, and, and now like Janelle Monet, Saul Williams, people who are considered Afrofuturist, but also Afro Nowist. And uh, under this understanding that you can't pull this thread and this, this belief that there can be any kind of utopia or, um, you know, revolutionary freedom world without black people, without blackness. And so you see those messages uh, enter uh, across geography and across the genre into the, the creative ecosystem, right? Um, who are some of the, I, when I think about, you know, Lucia, some of the artists that we are interested in, in including in the exhibition, Yatunde Olugbaju is one of them. Uh, Sydney Kane is one of them. Uh, I'm thinking about folks from House Full of Black Women, uh, Dr. Stephanie Ann Johnson and Alexa Burrell. Uh, would, would be considered, you know, afro Nowist uh, artists, practicing artists as well. So, you know, just to kind of, I think, complicate the waters around um, the conversation around power and privilege and who gets to define and say what is art, but who gets to say what is Black art and who gets to define and imagine a future and a, a future uh, outside of white supremacist thought, outside of those structures that have violently oppressed Black communities, uh, black artist and you know Afrofuturism, you know there there was this really beautiful article that you know I think I read that Taylor Crompton uh, wrote last year, um, talking about how Afrofuturism has always looked forward, and so you know we find that across the genre that that that's what I'll offer you know, in terms of how we start to look at this construct and these ideas and how they get how the methodologies um, get laid on top of a, a creative art practice and a social practice. It's beautiful. I mean, you also have Black Teachers behind you, the beautiful book by, uh, by Kimberly Drew. Um... <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, I just can't. I think it's on mute. I'm sorry. I'm saying, I said, this is the book I actually brought with me for my residency at, at uh, Villa SF to, to read all of the essays inside of this, this brilliantly put together book edited by Kimberly Drew and Jenna Worthen. So just shout out to those two black women scholar curators, you know, um, neither of whom have a PhD, by the way. <laughs> and so, you know, so as we talk about kind of like the, the blockages and the barriers and the structures of elitism that keep people from um, being able to enter into the art sector, into the art world. And, you know, you've worked in a museum and I, I've had, I have a, a three decades of being an independent curator across the genre with, without a PhD. Don't plan on getting one either, but do plan on continuing my commitment to, to Black liberation through creative art practice. Were you going to add something though to the Afrofuturist thought, the ideas, and help Jeff out with his, his he's, he's, he's grappling with it. <laughs> well, I'll touch on the abstract thing in a second. I guess the, um, right. the only thing I would say about the uh, Afrofuturism that for me personally is very important is that it, there, it's essential just to imagine a future with black people in it because white supremacy wants the world without it, without us. Um, that's ultimately what white supremacy is. Um, so Afrofuturism in, in one of my, in my mind is one of the most significant movements um, and thoughts uh, that what's the word, um, it's, it's very important for my practice um, in imposing, uh, how is it? Uh, Lorraine Hansberry once said that we can impose beauty on, in, in our world, we can impose beauty on our future. Um, and so part of Afrofuturism is imposing beauty by Im 
insisting that Black people will be present, that we will continue to be um, in this world. Um, and then uh, uh, kind of unrelated really, the, the abstract, abstract world and, and Afro, African symbols. Um, when you said that, I immediately thought of Hale Woodruff's work uh, after he came back from Africa, um, which is one of my least favorite works, bodies of his work, uh, because they're uh, in, you know, in the, in the Harlem Renaissance era, early 20th century, a lot of Black artists were told, you know, we need you to see uh, the Black aesthetic. We need to see like the, um, what is African about your work? And so a lot of artists were kind of forced to make an African aesthetic in a way, in, in my opinion, um, in part because having grown up in an African family, I could see the disparities between what was presented and what was, you know, lived for Africans um, at the time. Um, same with like, a, what's his name? The He's actually from New Orleans. There's a, a uh, what is his name? This is going to drive. I'm again, curator who can't remember names as a big fault of mine. Um, but there was an artist from New Orleans that was big in the Harlem Renaissance. And he was from an interracial family, married a white woman, very much part of like the white elite in Louisiana, but the Creole elite, I guess, as well. And when he moved to Chicago, he lived in a world where it was black and white in a way that he hadn't experienced. And he was told when he moved to Chicago and then to New York to paint black culture. But for so long, I felt his paintings was were kind of like this Toulouse-Lautrec voyeuristic imaging, of imagining of like the, the, the life of, of Black people. Because even though he was seen as Black outside of New Orleans, um, he, I, I, I don't know how much he identified with poor Black people, which was who the, like the, Har the Harmon Foundation wanted to see. If you were a Black artist and you had been a janitor, awesome, let's have a self-portrait of you as a gender painting because the whole point is so white people feel better about buying art by black people who are struggling. Mm -hmm. um, but the complexity <laughs> of <laughs> multiplicity of black identities were not something that were allowed to be explored. And um, uh, one day- I mean, but, but, but enter the conversation around classism, enter the conversation around privilege um, yeah. and, and, and you know, the really complicated relationship that U.S. culture has to artists, um, where we are uh, allowed such uh, grandiose kind of identities, and we're all like, Ooh, we want to be with the artsy people, and aren't they beautiful, but we do not, uh, we do not financially support that work. We do not um, encourage our children to be artists. Uh, I had a family, you know, my father is, is still a, a living, breathing artist who's 80 years old, living in Detroit, Michigan, painting every day still. But, and so my family was unique in my neighborhood growing up in Detroit. But I'm just saying in terms of the conversations around the privilege it is to be an artist and um, the, the hard places that it is to be an artist and what that means for, for black culture and uh, what we see as success, you know, financially, you know, um, much like your Nigerian family, it's like doctor, lawyer, engineer. Okay, that's that's it. <laughs> that's, that's all. It's like anything else is some some craziness. You know what I mean? And it's like African American family. It's like you will go to school, you will get your education. It cannot be taken from you. You know, but you definitely need to be on this track of like figuring out how to make money and have a job. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a. I mean, it would be beautiful, of course, if you had a job that was considered a white collar job. But, you know, I grew up uh, in a family where my father's uh, folks came up during the Great Migration from a tiny, tiny little town called Parker in Arkansas uh, up to Chicago and Detroit and um, uh, Cleveland. And they all worked at, they all worked in Motown. They all worked for Ford Motor Company and GM. And they put all of their children through college and half of them couldn't read. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like, I do this work so that you don't have to get your beautiful little manicure dirty, that you don't have to work in this factory, but that was a real skill. And it's a skill that, as you see, is being lost. And we, we look at the impact of the lack of um, people now being able to fix a car, build a wall, build a house, you know, build at all. 
you know, this idea even, and we can go on this on another conversation, digital art and NFTs, you know, um, and that whole section of the art world and creative practice where you actually are buying something that you won't ever tangibly hold and have uh, the ability to sit on a table or put onto your body or hang on a wall, that that is uh, also part of this conversation around privilege, you know, and access to education, access to technology uh, as well. I was actually talking to an artist here, uh, Abdi Farrow, who's this wonderful uh, artist who just got into the Kehinda Wiley uh, Black Rock uh, fellow. Uh, oh, nice, program. nice, okay. Um, and he was saying the favorite work of art he did during COVID was he re he redid his deck. Mm -hmm. um, he had to take up all the wood and put uh -huh. it back down. And he was like, As I'm most proud of having like resurfaced my deck. And <laughs> the feeling you get when you, you know, the, it's a concrete accomplishment. And you can think of the, kind of the history of what was art for, um, for black people in, in the time of slavery, quilting, mm -hmm. ironworks, mm -hmm. uh, woodworking, mm -hmm. you know, what, what we consider to be high art now. Um, it, it, you know, quilts are being accepted within museums now in, in a way that they weren't before. But, you know, what is, it also brings into question, what is art? What is high art? You know, what stuff that we have at the galleries that we have in exhibitions, um, but then how can we see art all around us? Um, yeah, it's not our tradition to be like, let me make something that is gonna be looked at on the wall. It's like, this is something I use every day. I mean, you're in New Orleans and I'm in San Francisco. These are two places that have exquisite metalwork exquisite, you know, and, and the ancestry uh, and the artistry that is those of us who work fire, you know, and work metal. It's like, there's nothing like it. And you see it, you know, that that's a special skill. It's a special gift. And the people are actually initiated into being metal workers, you know, uh, in different cultures. So it's, yeah, I mean, I hear exactly, you know, where you're coming from on this and, and how those symbols and the messages of our past are incorporated into that metalwork, you know, or into the cloth, you know, into the actual patterns on the cloth. And, you know, Jeff, you know, you've seen it in Haitian art and, and you know, that's, this is your, this is your lane, Lucia. So please jump in. It's not my lane. It's, I'm an, I'm an admirer, but this is Haitian art. This is your lane. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you know, what I see, what I see is us like making sure that those messages and memories and stories are still carried on um, in contemporary art as well. And I, I'm curious to see how they will be translated and transferred into what is now becoming a conversation on, on non-fungible, you know, uh, tokens, you know, like just art that's being created that I, that I can't touch. I am, I'm a person who loves ephemera. Give me, give me, you know, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, you know, um, it, it, just talking about um, metalwork and, and, and quilting and, and traditional um, art forms, and then it's um, relationship to what I guess we, we had for many, many centuries thought of as high art and and I love that barriers are being broken down it uh, makes me think of um, the artist Fred Wilson who I first encountered um, through an article about his um, museum collection intervention but then I was uh, actually working uh, as a public art panelist um, reviewing proposals for a project in New Jersey and his proposal come comes along and we uh, see that th this a whole series of projects he did with metal fencing, and his his um, his proposal was for uh, an iron metal fence with historical silhouetted images in it. Um, and I just saw that as this really interesting intersection of what um, was coming from a tradition of let's say metalworking and and more historical craft and then his knowledge and his practice of working with museum collections um, really fascinating to me where we have these um, uh, now combinations of of approaches and and conceptual ideas about 
how we can maybe break down barriers or explore in, 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 in both directions. Um, but I'm really mostly interested in seeing how the exhibition Collective Arising unfolds and will be presented in our galleries next year because we're now focusing or you're focusing on the black artist collectives of the Bay Area. And so as we close out our program, um, I just want to maybe bring the focus back down into what you um, might envision over the next year as you create this exhibition for us coming up in 2022. Well, uh, I think one, one beautiful way to kind of merge those two conversations is to, to talk about how school of black women and to talk about performance also as mm -hmm. a, um, a traditional art form, you know, the dance performance uh, ritual. Um, I mean, Haiti started, the Haitian rebellion started with the Bois Kimon ceremony, to think of that as a, a political collective statement um, is uh, something I hope to echo in our exhibition and, and working with performance artists to um, working with performance artists, I think we'll add another, uh, another layer to that um, in Five day, sorry, it's ten. It's a, a little bit past ten now on my on my end. And apparently, <laughs> um, <laughs> you have anything to add? <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, I'm I, I'm very interested in um, new media art right now, and I'm I'm interested in how there's a. a a new tendency inside of kind of like the contemporary art world, at least, you know, with some black and brown uh, artists who are using the other or inviting you to use your other senses as part of the experience of engaging the artwork. So, um, you know, my lane is community engagement. Like I, I am very much interested in how we get to create public ceremony uh, and public ritual and how that might show up not only inside of the galleries at the museum, but on the outside of the building, in, in the garden, in the parking lot. Um, Houseful of Black Women, again, is a, a good example to use uh, Dr. Stephanie Ann Johnson and uh, her work with light, her work with sound. Um, I was reading something like on Instagram, scrolling or something a couple of days ago with an artist whose primary um, a visual artist whose primary offering is uh, scent. Mm. And I was like, uh-huh, okay, how might we incorporate that kind of conversation? Um, what might it look like to have what House Full of Black Women calls an episode uh, happen through the streets, as you saw in the video, happen through the streets uh, outside of the museum and up those roads. Mm, you know, part of our conversation around how to you know, really how to get free is a, a conversation around how we choose ourselves. And uh, visual artist, San Francisco-based visual artist, Rodney Ewing, who's part of the Black Space Residency Collective, uh, when, I, when I mentioned to him some months ago that we were thinking about this show and uh, conversations with Black collectives, and I said, you know, what is this about a collective? And he said, you know, it's, it's artists choosing themselves and choosing each other and not having to wait for somebody to choose them. And, um, you know, not being like, you know, out on the playground and people are picking folks for your team and you don't get chosen for whatever reason. It's like black people saying, I choose you. Not only I choose you and I choose me. And you know we figure this out together, and we support each other. And and one of the the calls uh, that we've heard more and more over the last year during the uprisings of of 2020 at the the public murders of Ahmaud Aubrey, which just you know that anniversary just hit two days ago. You know of of Breonna Taylor killed sleeping in her home, uh, and obviously of George Floyd. I mean, we know that. Um, we got us and that's the way it has to be. So choosing us, this, um, this invitation for, collect for collectiveness, this invitation to like, you know, rise together 
is something that we insist upon. And I, and I think I'm also hoping that we figure out how to incorporate a, a musical tradition to this. And I'm thinking, of course, about the Freedom Suite that Max Roach, Roach and Abby Lincoln uh, pinned and offered to us and the screech of that demand and how um, that, that pulled people you know, closer into this, um, I insist. There, that's all. It, period, as that, we say, period, we it, insist. That's all. I am so excited about uh, this project and um, I love this I, idea of we choose us. Um, and we, we're so thrilled to, to welcome you to Sonoma County, to Santa Rosa, and to choose each other, to, to work with and to make something amazing happen and to, um, to take the message and move it forward. And uh, I, uh, uh, Margie Purser, who's a uh, member of our board and is in the audience tonight, and she, she uh, I know she has a little exchange going on with you, Ashara. Look forward to connecting you guys um, after this. But um, I love one of her comments is uh, Afrofuturism is radical imagining. And I love this idea of maybe some radical exhibition imagining and performance imagining for our community which will be um, just a great move forward. Uh, I just love adding to what we've done, building on it, and then adding all of this continuing into the future. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Lucia, for inviting me to, to play with you in this space and to be vulnerable in this space and to learn uh, together and, and to work with Jeff and the team um, and you know big ups to John for like running tech for us tonight <laughs> as well. Yeah hey, thanks for uh, making doing a shout out to John and to Jenny and actually I'm going to mention this uh, to our audience members uh, if you want to see more of this kind of free programming happening uh, for our museum for the whole community in the future uh, we do accept donations and uh, Jenny um, if you um, are able to put the uh, information in the chat so people can just uh, uh, simply uh, click and, um, and donate, that would be great. Maybe it's already there. I right? bet they have to scroll around and see. But um, anyway, um, it's really important that we get your support, um, everybody. And uh, for our audience members, thank you so much for being here. And uh, actually, uh, yes, the link is there. Um, it's museumsc.org uh, slash support. And just click on that and you can um, become a member, you can donate, you can support the work that we do. Um, on behalf of everybody at the Museum of Sonoma County, thank you, Ashara and Lucia for being our presenters tonight. And thank you, everybody for attending and thank you john and jenny for being our crew um everybody thank you and good night